is that silence without even asking for it? Um, I'm Laura Sands and I'm chair of the Food Foundation and very, very proud of what's happened today with the Food Foundation, with Nourish Scotland, WWF and Food Cardiff, um, all contributing, not just here in this wonderful venue in London, but also in Cardiff and Edinburgh. This is a nationwide campaign to veg out. Um, we are very, very pleased to have so many extraordinary speakers here today, but this is about pledging. And one of the passions that we have at the Food Foundation is not to constantly wag our finger at the consumer, not to constantly lecture families to how to eat better. It is about the food system stepping up and ensuring that people have access to the best food, that veg is part of everybody's mainstream diet. And I have to say today, it is very exciting to see the number of pledges and the companies that have come together. We've got you know, retailers on the high street who are going to be putting more veg in everything that they present. We've got retailers, supermarkets, making extraordinary pledges, and we hope that next year, because this is an annual veg out event, um, we'll see even more. Caterers, an area that is constantly um, forgotten, where a lot of us are eating our food through the catering sector. They have committed to increased veg portions. And we also have cities, and I'd like to say a huge thank you, particularly to Rosie Boycott and the London food team, who've both given us this wonderful location, but do so much in, in profiling food right across cities. So today, we have a very, very exciting array of speakers. We have a wonderful host who I will introduce in a second, or probably doesn't need that much introduction. But I'm going to ask you all to make one pledge now. On your social media, whatever it is, you're going to have to tweet your favorite vegetable with a hashtag, peas please. If we don't trend by the end of this afternoon, I tell you, we know where you live. So today is um, about vegging out, it's about peas, please, it's about commitments and it's about pledges. And we are going to see a very, very big change and they will be evaluated by a system that we're working with PwC on to ensure that those pledges get delivered but that we get more pledges in. So thank you again, but I am going to hand over to the voice of food. Absolute great, great pleasure to have our host today, Sheila Dillon. Thank you very much. Well, the queues are almost as long in the ladies as they are outside to get through the security, so it's a marvel I'm here. Um, well, we're here today, I mean, welcome to you all, and thank you very much for that introduction. We're here today to work hard, to pull together, by the end of the day, ideas and actions that are going to change the country, change the country's health, its tastes, and its pleasures, at least as far as we, the pleasure, pleasures on the plate. We're going to change our own lives, in fact, but we're not starting from year zero. Today, we're building on three years' work and the production of an eye-opening document, Veg Facts, a briefing, um, which you will find in your pack, and with, which was put together by the Food Foundation. Two facts that had me wide-eyed were that the richest tenth of this country, that's the luxury car driving private school, m private medicine group, spend three pounds 83 per week, per person, on fresh veg. That doesn't include potatoes. F fresh and processed veg. And that's only two pounds 17 a week above what the poorest tenth spend, which is one pound 66. So I worked out my own veg budget for the past few weeks. I'm not a vegetarian. I have an average middle class income, no luxury car, no private education for my child, no private health insurance. But my average vegetable spend is per person in my house is 17 pounds. And I tell you all that so that you know that this conference is being chaired by a vegetable saint. Um, 
The other eye popper was that in the last 30 years, the UK land planted to vegetables has declined by 26%. And that's in spite of the fact that Scotland has doubled its veg growing areas and Wales has upped its veg production by 34%, which means that production in England has dropped dramatic, dra dramatically. It's research done by the Food Foundation that we need to change things, to help to cut the 20,000 deaths a year that are linked to poor diet. The work has already begun. Over the last year, the Food Foundation has brought together 150 people in workshops to develop the commitments that are going to change how we spend our money, grow our food, improve our health, and help the environment. The new strategy, as you know, is called Peas Please, bringing together farmers, retailers, fast food and restaurant chains, caterers, processors, and government departments with a common goal of making it easier for everyone to eat vegetables. Big organizations and small made commitments, some grand, some modest. The point is now that we're working together, understanding that this isn't a consumer issue, it's a system problem. Lots of people want to eat more veg. They can't, they either can't afford them, they can't find them, or they don't know what to do with them when they get them home. So this is an action day with a packed program, an action day that's also taking place in Edinburgh and Cardiff, and we'll be getting news from them throughout the day. Here, we'll be hearing from four pledging panels, production, shopping and eating at home, and that includes many of the big retailers, eating out, and then food in towns and cities. Each of the panels will focus on how their sector is going to fulfill their pledges by 2020. And Anna said um, there's going to be holding feet to the fire, which is kind of a violent image, but there we are. You've got to do it. So after, but after lunch, beside the, the commitment panels, there'll be a panel on the real nitty gritty of the difficulties we face at home in eating veg, because this is not a culture that for a long time has valued veg. And it's going to be chaired by the woman who knows, B. Wilson, author of the insightful and ultimately optimistic first bite, how we learn to eat. Plus, two remarkable speakers, Professor Sir Michael Marmot and Dr. Dawn Harper, to remind us powerfully of why all this matters. Our diet is sickening us and killing us, as well as bankrupting the NHS, while our Department of Health seems to go on blissfully unaware that public health policy requires us to embed good diet in public health policy. And then we have the veg competition, the veg advertising competition, with Sir John Hegarty and Hugh Fernley Whittingstall joining the fray, plus the Barrow Band back there, and uh, monitoring veg puns down here. Um, and so, as you've just heard, our hashtag is peas please. So turn off the sound of your smartphones, but don't turn the phones off, because we want to let the world know what is going on here. So, to our first speaker, and she is an NHS doctor and TV presenter, Dr. Dawn Harper. Her biography is in your pack. I won't go through everything that you can read. But her experiences in the surgery and on screen gives her a unique perspective on why Peas Please matters. Dr. Dawn Harper. Ladies and gentlemen, can I start by saying thank you so much for letting me be part of what I think is a really exciting movement. So thank you for asking me. It's amazing to see so many people here who are all obviously from very, very different walks of life, but very passionate about vegetables. Um, and I really do think that days like today are what's going to really change and the work that you've been doing is going to really change uh, the situation that we have at the moment. And I'm going to start by telling a story uh, about one of the first television shows that I did, actually. Um, it was on a very uh, very small channel, which was great, because it meant I could make an idiot of myself and <laughs> nobody saw it. But it was a show called Who'll Age Worse? And the premise was we took couples, so either boyfriend and girlfriend, husband and wife, or siblings, or flatmates, or work colleagues, um, and we looked at their lifestyle um, 
everything about their lifestyle, the way they exercised, how much they smoked and drank, what they ate. Um, and then there was a panel of three of us, myself as a GP, a cosmetic dentist and a dermatologist. And we spoke to a very clever lady who does photo aging on, on a computer system and presented these young people with an image of what they would look like in 20 years' time if they continued the way that they were, they were eating and drinking and, and the lifestyles they were leading. And then we kind of gave them a bit of a motivation and told them if they changed their lives and they managed X, Y, and Z, this is how they could look. And I remember the, probably the first couple <coughs> that we saw were two uh, young lads, Essex boys, great. I mean, they were real cheeky chappies, living life to the full. And I remember opening this food diary and going sort of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I said, Mikey, I'm now at Thursday and this is the nearest we've got to a vegetable, and it's a deep-fried onion ring. He said, oh, yeah, he said, but I have a multivitamin at the end of the day, Doc, and that, that's what's going to save me. That's my saviour. And, you know, that, he was very funny. He was very cheeky. Um, he did get a little bit of a shock when we, um, when we showed him his photo-aged picture, although he did say, mind you, he said, your life's pretty much over when you're 40 anyway, isn't it? <laughs> but I think that's what we're up against. And I, I know when my kids were little... Um, they often used to say to me, you know, Mum, we're supposed to have five portions of fruit and veg a day, not a meal. And so we've always been very pro-vegetables in, in my family. And I'm really, um, with my GP hat on, I am genuinely really scared. We, uh, and I'm sure I'm talking, you know, I'm, I'm talking to the converted here, but m some of you may not know that we, on, in the NHS, we spend a million pounds an hour every single hour managing diabetes. And we know that 95% of that is type 2 diabetes, and the vast majority of that is a lifestyle illness. So we're spending a million pounds an hour. The NHS is under huge strain. We're also making new diagnoses of type 2 diabetes at a rate of 400 new cases per day in the UK. You don't need to be... Um, a politician, a mathematician, or a businessman to know that if the NHS is struggling at the moment... Um, then actually obesity and type 2 diabetes and our diets could actually bankrupt our NHS in our lifetime, in my lifetime. This isn't sort of in the never-never. This could really happen. And what I say to, whenever I'm talking about this, to, to colleagues, to family, to friends, whoever it may be, I say, do you know what? The NHS is like mum, okay? She's, you know, for most of us living in the UK today, she's always been around, um, she may not be perfect, and you may even feel that occasionally she lets you down. But one thing's for sure, when she's gone, you're going to really miss her. Um, I've worked in, in countries where there is no NHS, uh, and, it's, and it's a really horrifying thing to, to see, actually. And I genuinely think, I, really, I mean, it, it, we all have uh, a responsibility with whatever hats we've got. We've all got different hats. Um, I, have, I have a hat as an individual, as a mum, as a GP, as a broadcaster, as a friend and a colleague. Different hats. Um, we've all got different hats, and we all have to use every single angle we possibly can um, to try to improve the health of, of the nation and the way people live. Um, I think, you know, we, we've, we've created an obesogenic society here in the UK where it is too easy to be fat and unhealthy and to eat unhealthily, and it's quite difficult to do otherwise. And so what you're doing here in trying to change that whole tide, I think, is amazing. Um, I actually think that, that vegetables are, are the future. I... Um, I've just finished writing a book called Live Well to 101. And in writing that book, I interviewed various centenarians, both here in the UK and on the continent. Um, and these are centenarians who are living independently and fulfilled lives. And they had incredibly different stories. Um, very, very different stories, different uh, backgrounds, di different incomes. And some are living in Italy, some are living in, in Hull. You know, they're completely different stories. But they had some very, very striking things in common. And the two things that they really had in common, I'm going to start with they moved. They didn't go to Zumba class on a Wednesday evening or squash on a Friday night or play football on a Saturday morning. They moved. This is a generation who were pre-motor car and they moved and they are still moving and they were walking to the village shop or whatever it may be. But the other thing is they ate seasonally. They've experienced wars, they've experienced rationing, and they, they ate seasonally. They ate off, off of the turf, off of the ground, um, and, and an awful lot more healthily than most of us do 
who are a lot younger and a lot better informed. So um, I think vegetables are the future. I'm fantastically excited to hear what everybody else has got to say. And I really just want to reiterate a thank you for letting me be part of it. Thank you. I hear no music. Okay, you've got it. Carrots. Actually, there's a pea pod back there. <laughs> Didn't know she was coming. Um, well, our first commitments panel is focused on production, which is a crucial and sensitive subject as Brexit negotiations are underway. And it's being chaired by the head of the biggest vegetable growing company in the UK, John Shropshire. He's chairman of the G's Fresh Group with sales of 500 million pounds, 7,000 employees, and over 13,000 hectares of land in the UK, Poland, Spain, the Czech Republic, and Senegal. I expect he'll hold this panel to account. So, John, if you could come up and we'll get the others. Uh, the other members of the panel are Minette Batters, Deputy President of the NFU, whose pledge you will soon be able to see on the screen, I hope. Um, George Eustace, Minister of State uh, for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. We hope we'll see his pledge too. Uh, Neil Parrish, MP of the EFRA Select Committee, and David Drew, MP, Shadow Minister for Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And John, I will now leave this to you. All right, thank you, Sheila, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people here. In fact, um, we're all quite squashed in, really, aren't we? <laughs> and <laughs> and my panel, look at them, they look absolutely radishing this morning. <laughs> and I'm sure we're going to be full. Uh, we're going to be hearing about a lot of little gems. And uh, maybe our MPs can even leak a bit of information <laughs> to give us some encouragement, a bit of a carrot, so that we can start to see some green shoots of a plan for horticulture and get down to the root of the issue. <laughs> um, we want to be peppered with enthusiasm. And we don't want to say at the end of the day that we've all been here before. Ting? Bean? Bean? <laughs> now, I voted for Romaine, but Brexit is obviously a massive opportunity for our industry. Agriculture is impacted 
more than any other industry by Brexit. So it is a fantastic opportunity because we've been ruled by cap for a very long time. So I, though, have to declare an interest because this industry pays my salary. <laughs> so let's all make a pledge, grasp this opportunity, words into action. Uh, the opportunity is, for our industry, another one and a half million tonnes of vegetable and salad production in the UK. That is a massive opportunity. We have a commitments framework and we need to make pledges against those points. And I think what we're going to be looking for is a commitment to support the development of a new sector deal for horticulture that will enable producers to increase the volume of sustainably produced British vegetables and also a commitment from the select committees to commit to an inquiry into horticulture. So there's the sort of things that we need to be looking for amongst many pledges today. And with that, I'm going to pass on to my panel. And who's going to start us off? Minette, are you going to kick us off? Oh, Chairman, thank you very much. And, and I can never match um, you on the, the amount that you got in there. I've got some important things to say, and I, I will try and, and get a few um, in there as, as we go. But um, starting off with Brexit certainly has put us all in a pickle. I'm going to leave it there until I get to the end, that's for certain. But look, um, Dawn Harper talked about you know, the many hats we wear. You know, I'm here very much as, as a mum of, of twins, one of which does have type 1 diabetes, and I, I know what it's like for children to live with that. And, and it is important that we do absolutely every single thing that we can to make sure that children do not develop type 2 diabetes. Um, but in my role as Deputy President of the NFU and as a farmer in Wiltshire, we very much recognise you know, the need to increase consumption of fruit and veg for the health of the nation and also, as, as John says, for British horticulture to grow. And it's why we launched our, our Fit for the Future campaign 18, 18 months ago with 34 different asks of industry and government. We are committed to continue that engagement right across the industry and to ensure that those words are turned into actions and to support the Food Foundation's amazing, I really do think it is an amazing campaign, the Peas Please, Please campaign, which very much shares all our goals. But as John has, has pointed out, there are a number of critical barriers uh, to increasing production of fruit and veg in the UK, not least the uncertainty surrounding Brexit and ongoing challenges to secure a sufficient numbers of seasonal and permanent workers. Through our certified schemes, for example, Red Tractor and Leafmark, Britain leads the way uh, on production standards, on traceability and quality but we are at risk of exporting production to countries with higher environmental impacts, cheaper labour and less stringent standards. The NFU is totally committed to securing the best possible deal for British farming to ensure that we can remain competitive and increasingly global marketplace. Um, I'm just going to finish with saying, you know, we have to stop. Uh, we cannot beat about the bush any longer. <laughs> it is time to act. Um, because we cannot wait for tomorrow. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So, thank you, Minette. I think we'll, we've got a bit of time for a question or two. Should, should we, we do, do you want to take them all at the end? Okay, yeah, fine. Okay, so, Minister, would you like to... Yeah. Well, thanks very much, John, and um, you've certainly given us a good head start on the uh, pun game that I know is being uh, run today. Um, all I can say to add to that is uh, there will be carrots as well as sticks in our um, new policy towards uh, the farmed uh, environment. Um, does that not qualify? <laughs> <laughs> Surely. Um, yeah, they're, they're I, uh, you had to work uh, hard yes, for it, George. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sticks of celery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 
As a number of you know, I was involved in the veg industry myself. I studied commercial horticulture. And in fact, our family farm um, grew quite a lot of winter cauliflowers in Cornwall and uh, spring green cabbages. And we had a farm shop where we also grew um, well over 30 different fruit and vegetable crops. Uh, so I've got um, first-hand experience of this uh, industry. Uh, spent many uh, a winter uh, in the harsh um, gale force winds and uh, hailstorms of Cornwall harvesting uh, some of this veg. So it's an industry uh, that I believe I understand well and that is uh, dear uh, to my heart. Um, I also um, uh, wanted to say that when it comes to the health benefits uh, of veg, these are uh, universally um, recognised and both the Department for Health and DEFRA and all parts of government uh, are trying to increase people's uh, consumption of veg. Uh, the Department for Health obviously runs a number of schemes like the Healthy Start scheme to help people on very low incomes uh, ensure that they can afford uh, to buy uh, fresh uh, fruit and veg. We've also got schemes running in schools, particularly for uh, infant children, to make sure they've all got access uh, to free uh, fruit uh, and veg as well. But I think um, what I really like about the work that the Food Foundation is doing, and in particular your uh, Peas Please campaign, is we need to try to uh, change the culture around our food and change perceptions uh, around veg, because the truth is uh, that veg is not very expensive uh, in, in, in the scheme of things. And I remember having a debate on this actually when the contentious issue of food banks was being discussed. And somebody said to me, well, veg, you know, it's too expensive, so people buy ready meals and pizzas instead. I don't really buy that. You know, a, a pizza uh, and a ready meal will always cost more uh, than fresh ingredients, fresh veg that people prepare themselves. Uh, and then they said, oh, well, the problem is that veg goes off uh, quickly, and so people are worried about storing it. I don't really buy that either because um, veg, things like carrots and potatoes and many of these things, uh, the sort of wear crops, if you like, will store uh, for many, many weeks or months. Um, most people have fridges and even cabbages will last for weeks in fridges. All of these things will last far longer uh, than some of the ready meals that uh, people say they uh, have to resort to. And of course now we have a very successful uh, sector in veg when it comes to frozen veg. Um, peas, the peas industry is one of our uh, probably most dynamic and most successful uh, veg sectors uh, in this um, country, uh, really at the cutting edge of, of technology. And of course, uh, it is a, basically a, a very cheap staple product that people uh, can buy. So I think uh, the work that the Food Foundation is doing to try to change um, attitudes and change the culture and get people uh, eating more fruit and veg is absolutely crucial. Now, um, John said that he was on the Remain side of the campaign. As a number of you will know, I was on the Leave side because I actually believe this is a great opportunity for us to uh, think afresh about how we do uh, our agricultural uh, policy going forward. And the truth is that the veg industry has never really benefited that much uh, from um, the common agricultural policy. Uh, it was totally uh, unsupported historically. Uh, it's only really in the last decade with the introduction of the area-based single farm payments that veg producers started really to get anything much at all um, from the um, common agricultural policy. But even then, uh, the payment is um, uh, not a major part of their um, uh, the structure of their businesses as a general because these are quite intensive sectors. Um, I do know that the producer organisation scheme, which supports veg uh, businesses to come together, uh, to collaborate on marketing, but also in other areas as well, has been valued by the industry. Uh, it's by no means perfect. There are many, many faults with it, bureaucratic problems with it. We could do far better at designing uh, a scheme uh, of our own. And what I'm really interested in um, for the veg sector is whether rather than just supporting businesses to come together for marketing, we could actually look at supporting um, leading players in the veg industry uh, to come together collaboratively for other purposes, uh, such as research and development. Because the truth is, um, in the veg industry, there are some very large players. Um, they are competitors. They all run their own sales offices and their own pack houses. Uh, often, they don't need to come together to cooperate to deal uh, with supermarkets because they're in competition uh, with one another. Uh, but if um, there are a number of carrot growers who've got a particular agronomic challenge around, say, carrot fly, they've all got a, a, a joint interest in coming together to support uh, the right kind of plant breeding that can give you um, the, the genetic resistance, perhaps, uh, or other approaches that would uh, support their industry. So we're looking very closely 
um, uh, and a real opportunity now as we design a new agriculture policy focused on uh, investing uh, in knowledge transfer, focused on supporting um, new technology and research and development. There's a real opportunity uh, that the horticultural industry that's been overlooked for far too long uh, could actually uh, start to get uh, the right kind of support so that it can grow uh, as an industry and uh, supply more of our UK market. The final thing uh, that I want to say is there's a role uh, too for government and we've been uh, making important steps over the last few years to change uh, procurement rules and to get uh, government bodies, government departments, uh, schools and hospitals doing far more to source wholesome food, locally produced uh, food uh, and often uh, that means British suppliers as well. And um, we introduced something we called the Balanced Scorecard a couple of uh, years ago, designed by Peter Bonfield. And this was all about saying it's not just price. You should also look at how wholesome food is, its impacts on the environment, the socio-economic impact of supporting uh, local producers. And we've backed that up just uh, recently uh, by uh, making a commitment which uh, I hope will add to your um, list of commitments today, uh, to launch a new um, marketplace, a new website that will be a hub uh, for local vegetable producers up and down the country uh, to register the products that they have, uh, and effectively this will be a portal uh, that public bodies can use uh, to make sure they are buying uh, local veg produced locally uh, to the highest uh, standards. Uh, we've also made it a requirement um, under the... Uh, framework used by Crown Commercial that all government departments will now use uh, this balanced scorecard. It is no longer an option, no longer something we are chivying them to do. It is now uh, an absolute requirement. So there's a couple of things that we're doing uh, at DEFRA, uh, but it's a really exciting time as we consider future policy. Well, thank you, Minister. There's some really great things, great content in that. It's really encouraged. I think what we need to probably try and distill out is one or two real pledges, but um, really... Really encouraging words. Uh, Neil, can we? Well, thank you very much. Um, of course, Brexit is very much a hot potato. Um, I rode my bike in this morning, and I was as cool as a cucumber. <laughs> um, my mother has an interesting expression that two heads are better than one, even if one is a cabbage. Um, not terribly complimentary to somebody. Um, but um, it is good to be here. And of course, my role is very much a sort of scrutineer of government. I chair the Environment, Food, Rural Affairs Select Committee, so it's good to have a, a very hands-on minister like George. We've got a new Secretary of State with Michael Gove, who also has some new ideas and, and new visions. And so it's really very important for us as a select committee to, to keep an eye on what's going on. And of course, one of the big issues for, for vegetables growers, especially if you're growing um, at a, a, a you know quantity um, is making sure there's labor here uh, and there's enough labor actually to pick um, and look after those vegetables and that vegetable production because um, otherwise you know quite putting it quite simply if we haven't got the labor um, then we will export the production and that's certainly what we don't want and I know government doesn't want it and I think it's also how we balance you know if you've got some very big producers who the, the large retailers and you've got some of them represented here I see I won't mention you know particular big retailers by name uh, but it's you know they naturally quite like to buy big quantity uh, they like to have a continuity of supply they need to be able to get hold of large quantities when they need it and I think it's making sure that you know our growers can can compete in that market um, and I think that's where perhaps government has a role in in the future to, to try and help that happen I mean it's going to be interesting to see whether we're going to sort of move on to sort of lasers to kill weeds and all these types of things um, because you know again that would, would reduce the amount of labor but of course it is means a big investment um, for for those growers and I think we, we all accept and, and we all enjoy vegetables um, and so we need to get more um, and and of course you know there's there's the the organic sector there's the conventional sector um, everybody's interested in in trying even if they're not buying organic to have less pesticide and fungicides on on the vegetable production and so all of this is sort of challenging as we move forward because we do need enough of our tools in the box to be able to produce but we also want to make sure um, they are as healthy as possible when we come to eat them and so I think you know there's, there's a lot to be said now for a, a new
new world as we as we leave um, the, the common ag agricultural policy. And I think, as George has said, there's been very little sort of direct support for the vegetable sector in the past. And I think it's something perhaps I don't think we mean meant to neglect it, but in some ways I think we do. Um, you know, certainly as far as inquiries that we've had in Parliament, we look a lot at you know the beef sector, the lamb sector, the dairy sector, the cereals, um, all sorts of production. Um, but we don't necessarily look big time at vegetables. And so I'm hoping that next year we will be able to actually have an inquiry into the horticulture and, and vegetable sector because I think it's going to be important. And uh, like I said, it's just really making sure that, uh, and, and George said about procurement from government and it's just, you know, all public bodies really. Um, but of course, in the end, we also need to be competitive as well. And I think that's where the government's looking to sort of bring some help in to, to help growers become more competitive uh, and I think that will also work so I think it's a you know it is a, a you know a great time for, for vegetable production and, and I think we've just got to try and make sure that perhaps you know when we're you know waste to heat plants and all these types of things where where there is heat coming out can we not actually put more greenhouses and glass houses and all sorts of things if we need you know slightly more exotic production during the winter uh, which we can't necessarily grow all the time um, there is real scope for that I mean if you look at the Dutch you know they're you know I know this they sometimes criticize for the amount of energy they use um, through their, their greenhouses but they certainly do have an, an, an awful lot of production all season round because I think that is the challenge because retailers want it all the way all the time round we don't go in so much for seasonality of vegetables anymore as well now I'd like to see people be much more seasonal in, in what they buy and I think some people are, but I think also people will also want to go and get their tomatoes, their lettuce and their cucumbers and all these things that they buy, their peppers um, and, and, and courgettes and so on. Courgettes can be grown quite a lot of the year. And so, you know, lots of things I think we can extend. It's a little bit like the sort of tourist season. I think we could actually extend our, our vegetable season um, and grow more here. And then, like I said, grow in quantity uh, for, for the big retailers and also then, you know, market and make sure we've got markets in place for all that smaller type veg, the, 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 you know, the, the boxed veg and things that people deliver directly um, from, their, from their growers and farms. And so I think there's a lot we can do. And so, uh, you know, I look forward to, um, you know, a very bright future. Brilliant. Um, again, uh, very encouraging. Very encouraging. Ting? <laughs> <laughs> We're having to work harder now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Um, David, can we move on to you? Well, I'm the opposition, so uh, I suppose I ought to say some slightly different things. Um, I'll start with declaring interest. I'm a vegetarian of over 40 years. I'm still standing, so please grow more vegetables so I can continue to uh, stand and enjoy my food. I mean, when I started as a vegetarian, I mean, the idea of going out to eat was they gave you a couple of boiled eggs if you were lucky. So things have moved on an awfully long way, but I still get rather annoyed that when I do go out and eat, that the meat eaters get all these wonderful uh, selections of different uh, things, and uh, I usually get the one choice, uh, usually well cooked and well prepared, but uh, it would be nice to think that sometimes we get equality of uh, uh, provision. Um, I mean, the other thing that you might be interested in, I am a, a long time associate our Forest Green Rovers. We are the world's first vegan football club. Uh, if you can convince uh, footballers and uh, football supporters that vegetables are an alternative lifestyle, you're doing well. We've had some interesting arguments with both, uh, but some of our players actually have gone vegan, and uh, when we win on Saturday, it will prove that you can be vegan and win football games. Um, so it's a, an interesting time in the world of first. food. Um, uh, <laughs> What I would say is that uh, in my previous incarnation when I was a county councillor, I, mean, I chaired the county farm estate in Gloucestershire, and we had about 12 horticultural holdings as an important part. I mean, I think some of you will know that the idea of uh, county small holdings were created post uh, First World War, uh, land fit for heroes and all that, and it was important that we 
had a variety of provision, uh, largely dairy, but uh, uh, a number of horticultural holdings. Sadly, most of those have now gone. A question of underinvestment, a question of pressure on county councils, development opportunities, because they were largely close to Cheltenham, so it meant that the holdings were sold. There is a real challenge of how we reinvest, I won't say wither on the vine, uh, that's as close as I get to puns, how we reinvest in our horticultural sector, which is very, very important. I don't know why our level of self-sufficiency in vegetables is declining. It shouldn't be. I mean, certainly I'm pushing my front bench that we come up with an 80% self-sufficiency target in terms of how we redesign our common agricultural policy. Uh, it's just so important that we grow more vegetables. But we come up against a number of problems. Obviously, we talked about Brexit, and I'll park that because that will be overwhelming us over the next few months. But we've got a number of natural challenges. Soil erosion being key water management, and of course biodiversity. Now all those things have to be brought into a redesigned agricultural policy. It must be written against the background of climate change. That is something that we have to face up to. Uh, and this sector faces more difficulties than others in that respect because of those natural uh, challenges. So I hope, uh, puns aside, that we, you know, we do have a farming policy fit for the future one that actually encourages us to be more self-sufficient and that the vegetable horticultural sector with all the ways in which you know people's diets are changing going back to my you know football uh, interest uh, it is just fascinating how people who would never dream of going vegetarian and they haven't gone vegetarian but they are vegetarian two or three days a week now they don't eat meat every day now, that is the way a lot of people now live their lives. So we need to be able to satiate that demand. We need to be able to make sure that people have choice, and we certainly need to make sure that we produce more of our own. Good. Thank you, David. Yeah, again, very encouraging. Right, well, now I think we can open it up to some questions. And... Um, does anybody want from the floor to ask any questions? A question yeah. up there. Yeah. The Professor Krebs. <laughs> I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to thank the panel for their comments. And I have a question for George Eustace, um, a comment about the definition of vegetables and a comment about uh, uh, the last contribution on soils and water. Uh, for George, um, you mentioned various um, policies that the government's introducing to promote uh, consumption of local fruit and vegetable or local vegetables. I wondered if you've got any data to track what their impact is on consumption levels. That's the question. Uh, comment about the definition. Uh, when I was chair of the Food Standards Agency, I asked why potatoes are not vegetables. <laughs> Uh, and the answer was because they're starchy foods. Um, so I'd like to ask the panel, are potatoes vegetables or starchy foods? And my third comment is to echo the last uh, speaker's um, reflections on the impact of climate change. I used to chair the Climate Change Committee's Adaptation Subcommittee, and one of the key points that we've drawn out in the risks of climate change is that within a generation, because of a uh, loss of soil, and because of water shortage, our most fertile agricultural land in this country will not be suitable for growing uh, crops or vegetables. So what is the government doing to address that problem? George, I think this is for you. <laughs> yes, um, <clears throat> I haven't got all the, um, um, uh, 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 lots of statistics with me on um, the impact of some of these programs yet, and, and you'll appreciate that uh, what we've done um, in launching this, um, this new uh, marketplace, this new online hub, um, that is new, that's only just started. And it was in fact uh, a vegetable producer in Cornwall uh, who'd said to me that we should do this um, because people like them are actually up for doing this. Uh, and they uh, thought that there was a real opportunity to have this kind of online um, presence. Um, however, um, we have made progress in terms of getting um, some government to answer, notably 
MOJ, uh, Ministry of Justice, even when we were, uh, this was a sort of voluntary approach, but a strongly encouraged approach, uh, a lot of them were adopting the balanced scorecard. Uh, and I think that making it uh, clearly a universal requirement uh, under the um, you know, Crown commercial framework is going to increase the, the amount of uh, local sourcing uh, that you get. I've got an example in my own uh, constituency, actually, the local NHS, um, who set up something they call the the food unit, uh, and this is something that uses um, local produce, um, a lot of local veg, to make sure they've got really good wholesome food in hospitals um, uh, in, in the area. So there's great opportunity there. It's also, I think, the case that the, the work that's been done to have um, universal free school meals for infant age children, it's a great opportunity. In my view, one of the key uh, objectives of that was to uh, get, these, uh, get children at a young age used to eating in a healthy way, used to having a balanced diet, and I think it'll, it'll help in, in that regard. Um, on your point about soils, which uh, I will... Um, sidestep the potato question uh, I've always sort of slightly regarded as a veg but there are these anomalies tomatoes are technically a fruit, fruit even though yeah. uh, they would be regarded by most as a salad um, so there are lots and lots of things like this but um, when it comes to soils uh, I couldn't agree more uh, and one thing I um, can say uh, is that uh, both Michael Gove and I and Therese Coffey are all of the uh, same view uh, that um, uh, attention to detail on soils and soil health uh, is going to be absolutely crucial to delivering a lot of our objectives um, for the future uh, because there are connections between the health of our soils uh, and even air quality. It can uh, lock up carbon if you manage soils the right way. Uh, there are connections between soil health and water quality. It can reduce leaching of, of nitrogen. And um, one of the arguments that I make is I think we uh, perhaps have forgotten some of the uh, traditional husbandry techniques that maybe my great-grandfather might have done um, to really um, make sure you've got um, humus in the soil. This is it's an, almost not an old-fashioned word now to use the word humus. Uh, people talk about organic matter or OM uh, if, if you're a scientist. But the truth is that there's something about the humus in the soil, uh, the mycorrhizal relationship between bacteria and fungi uh, and the roots, uh, and it's a dynamic living thing soil. It's not just about chemistry. Uh, it is a, uh, a living environment, and in my view, um, the policies that we've had have probably driven too much specialisation, um, and that has uh, damaged crop rotation to the point that then the CAP say, well, now you have to have a three-crop rule uh, to try to deal with that, which is a, a very blunt instrument to deal with it. So I think actually having um, a, quite a sophisticated approach to changing uh, soil husbandry is, is really important, and it's definitely something we're looking closely at. Um, I, w I would echo George's words. I think you know, bringing grass into a rotation, even with even with um, cropping of, of vegetables, would be good with the humus. As, and, and I also think on water, we are actually going to probably have to look towards more recycling of water, and perhaps some of that can actually be then used for cropping as well. Because I think you know, eastern counties in in particular, um, you know, the, the water situation um, can be quite uh, you know quite dire. And of course, we're going to look at abstraction in the minute, aren't we? And and so all of these things are going to be quite challenging as we as we come through. Okay, is there? Do we have a nutritionist who can give an answer on this potatoes, potatoes. versus vegetables? Because <laughs> the vegetable as a potato the farmer, I'd absolutely <laughs> love to see less rice and spaghetti in people's <laughs> diets. the highest ingredient for potassium by portion size, which is something very many people lack. But vitamin B6 and potassium, it's classically, it is a vegetable. The, the anti-starch thing is, is a nonsense. Um, so <laughs> eat more potatoes. <laughs> Brilliant. Good. Okay. Okay. He's probably a potato grower, is he? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. We very produce... Good potatoes in Britain and the market for fresh potatoes has declined very substantially continuously over the last 30 years. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Laura. Yeah. Just because we're focusing on how um, agriculture and health really come together, 
to what extent does um, the Department of Health and DEFRA actually design common policies that can work? I know that each does their own thing in their own silo, but in many ways, this is a concerted effort about linking production um, in ways markets, whether they be online platform markets or, or physical markets, uh, retailers, and then the health community as well. And I just wonder whether there were any plans or any thoughts about having plans. Um, well, um, Laura, you've been in Parliament. You'll know that joined-up government is a fine thing. Uh, and we, uh, we talk about it endlessly, and we hopefully, uh, year by year, get closer uh, to securing it. But we do work very closely with our colleagues in the uh, Department for Health. Um, and um, uh, obviously, um, some of the uh, schemes that, uh, that we have in, in schools um, were involved uh, with both the Department for Education and the Department for Health to uh, encourage those. And um, the general, um, I suppose, division of responsibility, the, the focus of, of DEFRA uh, is uh, very much on um, how we make sure we've got uh, our production right and the health of our soils right. And um, there are lots of overlaps on this with both health and the environment. Um, the Department for Health takes the lead when it comes to public health messages. Uh, they are the holder of the budget, as it were, uh, for the, that sort of public health uh, advertising, so they lead on that. But uh, you're, you're aware, um, whatever anybody does, whether DEFRA wants to do something uh, or whether the Department for Health wants to do something, there's a process we have in government called Write Round, which is very, won't bore people with the detail, but broadly it means writing to every other department to check they're also happy uh, with, with what you're doing. And that does force quite a lot of collaboration and joint working. I, I think, George, it's not your fault, but I don't think government does work together by yeah. enough at all. And it's very bureaucratic. Um, and departments, you know, are, are like sort of ivory towers half the time. And so it is not just health, it's education as well. Because you see, you know, a lot of my primary schools, they've got a little patch for vegetables and the like. And I think that's really good because perhaps some of those children aren't used to having very many vegetables with their diet at home. And I think that's really good as well. So I think we can work. And that's we try with this, we're trying on air quality. We're trying to get four select committees to work together on air quality. That's a challenge in itself. So I can understand where, why government finds it a challenge. But I think, you know, things aren't in one department. And DEFRA is a very draw department and it affects many others. Um, and I know George works very hard to try and make. But sometimes, you know, DEFRA will put out something and then the health department will put out something, you know, on dairy, perhaps totally contradicting um, what's coming from, from DEFRA. And, and that is what we don't need either. So, Neil, I mean... If we can get an inquiry into horticulture and with a select committee, that can help solve some of those issues. We can so certainly can highlight them, today. yeah. And, and of course, the whole idea of a select committee has put forward some ideas where, where government could work more closely together. And um, then we, we try and make sure we, we gnaw away at the table until um, ministers take some notice. And eventually the table falls over and they do take notice. But, you know, that's, that's the way we do it. I think is that, John, a, is that a pledge, a... Neil? Is that yes, a pledge? it is. Yeah, no, I, I'm quite happy to pledge that because, you know, it's something I feel very strongly about. And, of course, it's easier in some ways for select, select committees to say, you know, you, must, you government must do it this way. I understand when, when government and departments and, and civil servants and, and the bureaucracy of it is all there, it's more difficult. But, uh, you know, no, very happy to look at all that. Good. Thank you. Manette, did you want to...? I did just want to make a, a quick comment because... Um, we are very lucky to have uh, George as our farming minister who has a, an in-depth knowledge, but I think across government it, it is not joined up. Um, we do not have, have food on the school curriculum. We do not learn about food production on the school curriculum. And we have to address the reasons as to why we have this obesity crisis. Uh, in, in children, um, the point made about grade one land, you know, we are losing grade one land all the time because it is not protected you know the focus is on urban areas it is not on land we are a country of 65 million people and growing um, delighted that we're going to have an environment plan but we don't have a food plan coming out so you know as I say we are lucky with this minister but for government as a whole you know we do need a new ambition uh, that is far more joined up right across government you know I feel farmers as the custodians of 70 percent of land have a massive role to play but they have to be given that opportunity so we would look forward to a much more joined up uh, attitude going forwards and that you know the procurement situation it, it, five years I think the contracts had to be put in place for so we need cross-party commitment on this we cannot have this stop start uh, approach it has to be joined up and it has to have a cross-party commitment as well so Minette you've got a sorry <laughs> didn't want to <laughs> stop you. the floor um, 
you've got a very big, wide and challenging task, haven't you, in the NFU. Are you going to be able to make a pledge that uh, horticulture is going to get the focus? I look. I've always. I'm. I'm a bee farmer in Wiltshire. Uh, of of all the progressive sectors, horticulture is 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 quite phenomenal. Um, I've been lucky enough to visit John's business, G's business. It's breathtaking. Their commitment to their soils, the environment, um, is phenomenal. I'm going to make a little uh, commitment for for all those people with with producing ornamentals out there. The poor people who are producing flowers in this country. The ornamentals have fallen short of the G Scott. We were talking about potatoes uh, not being classed as a vegetable and I'm delighted now that they are a first class vegetable um, but ornamental production has not been part of the GSCOP either because it's not deemed to be a, a grocery so again that's that's about a joined up process going forwards but if any sector can fly as a result of Brexit it is horticulture it is fruit vegetables and flowers the real essential need that, that every um, progressive country in the world has is a commitment to be able to bring in seasonal labour from other parts of the world. That's not unique to us. That's every country in the world, whether it's Australia or America. And we need to get that certainty now in Brexit. It's created so much uncertainty. We need to be able to have seasonal workers who come here, um, do a fabulous job. Anyone who's tried to pick a ton of strawberries knows how, what a phenomenal commitment this is. And you and I couldn't even... I know you were... were were doing strawberries uh, before you were a minister, but it's, it's amazing, the commitment, isn't it? And the hard work involved. Yes, I mean, you, you get this, I think, um, in many horticultural sectors. Not, not all veg sectors, a lot of them would be quite mechanised on things such as, you know, carrots and potatoes, but um, certainly uh, the brassica veg and, um, and strawberries is probably the most extreme example. The, uh, the level of, um, the degree of organisation required uh, to put together the, uh, the infrastructure and the labour uh, for a sometimes, uh, uh, well, it's a longer season than it used to be, but a relatively short season is a, is a huge um, logistical undertaking, which I, I did for a number of years. So in an inquiry we had last year looking into labour, um, we had the then Home Office Minister Robert Goodwill said that you know, we could bring in a seasonal workers and permitting system you know, within six months. Now, I think that's a challenge a for any, any government. Um, and so you know, I think we've just got to monitor the situation and we'll be, we'll be having another look at the situation on labour quite, quite soon because um, see, it's, not, it's not just about Brexit, it's also uh, about the fact that the value of the pound has dropped by about 20%. And of course, you know, those that are coming Coming over here to work um, are not getting as many schlotties or whatever for their for their pounds, and that's affecting us as well. So you know we do really need to take this seriously, otherwise we won't be able to pick our our vegetables. Okay, thank you. Can we have another question from the audience? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Theresa Wickham. Um, as a grower, I want to make a comment and ask a question. Uh, probably because we've been the unsupported side of the industry, uh, we've been closer to the consumer, and we've probably done better but another government department, the government has brought out an ag tech strategy. And what the horticultural sector does need is looking at what are the future needs with technology, how can we use them, how can we be more commercial and sustainable. The only sector that hasn't got any money out of this ag tech strategy is the horticultural sector. Livestock's just got 30 million from biz. Uh, so my question is, when you're looking at it, A, why didn't uh, the sector get anything? Did we do the wrong things? And when you're doing your report, that's, that's the sort of help that the industry needs to be modern, progressive, and deliver what the consumer wants. And we're on the sidelines on this. David, can I just ask you to give an opinion on that? No, I, yeah. I totally Raise agree. I issue. mean, as I said, I mean, sadly, it is the most undercapitalized part of our agricultural sector in the sense that, that it gets no support. I mean, I would be looking at capital allowances. I'd be looking at ways in which we can uh, help uh, to go back to more mixed farming. Uh, but that isn't going to substitute for the fact that the horticultural sector itself you know, needs to, if you like, become more vibrant and government needs to help it to become more vibrant. Okay. Yeah, I'm not... Do I, yes, I mean... Um, I think there's two parts to the agri-tech strategy. This is a, it's a £160 million uh, fund, and we're definitely looking at uh, what we replace that with because my view is that uh, agricultural technology is incredibly uh, important and we need to have ongoing programmes in this space. 
Um, and I'm also interested in whether we could do more to support um, uh, the type of work that, that, that might be considered slightly nearer a market when it comes to plant breeding mm. uh, and things like that. So it's not just sort of um, uh, lofty academic theory that's never implemented, but we actually get, uh, you know, the real challenge quite often is there's lots of academic research goes on, lots of uh, people in universities have paid money to do the research, but actually getting that transferred onto farm is sometimes where the challenge is. Uh, and the crucial, probably the crucial thing is around things like plant breeding. But coming back to your point on the agri-tech um, fund, there's, there's a component called the Catalyst Fund. And I think some of that actually has gone to um, veg projects. There's, there's, there's lots and lots of different individual projects. Uh, but you're right, there were then um, five uh, so-called centers of excellence, um, one of which was on livestock, um, one of which was on, uh, on crops, one of which was on uh, agri-metrics, but that's a generic one. That's around how we use data on farms, which would be of use to, um, uh, to the, uh, the veg industry. And the other one was on precision agriculture, which is around um, you know, new technologies such as satellite technology, which would have some benefit for the veg sector. So that, that had a sort of overlap, if you like, between both arable uh, and indeed uh, the veg sector. So I know there wasn't a dedicated veg one, but the agrimetrics one and the, um, uh, the, the one on um, uh, um, technology and, and um, uh, uh, mechanization, I think would be one that would benefit, uh, benefit, uh, benefit horticulture. But look, you, I've been clear. I think we should be supporting it. And as we change uh, the direction of agriculture policy, so it's more about productivity, um, the, the veg sector, uh, I think is in the space to have that sort of support. Great, that's almost a pledge, fantastic. <laughs> Can we have a question? Thank you. Um, this is for George, but also interested to hear the thoughts of others in the panel. Uh, my name is Tom Wells from Tradecraft. Uh, and this is picking up on something that Manette uh, mentioned, but just to kind of foreground it. Um, one of the concerns of vegetable farmers in this country and beyond is predictability of income. Um, the power dynamics of supply chains are such that powerful buyers, whether from large brands or processes, are able to change at the last minute terms of orders, the size of orders, the cost of orders, or, uh, or the uh, quality required. Uh, and that obviously makes a lot of trade very fraught for producers, especially producers of perishable goods, who perhaps don't have the ability to find an alternative market because they're essentially sitting on a time bomb in which they've invested money in a crop. So it needs to be sold, and therefore they'll often sell at the low cost price. Um, we have in the UK, as the panel I'm sure are aware, a regulator that prevents unfair trading practices between supermarkets and their direct suppliers, the Groceries Code Adjudicator. Mm. Uh, and so my question is, what plans does the government have to tackle unfair trading practices in the parts of the supply chain that aren't currently covered <coughs> by the GCA? Well, it's, there's no doubt about it. It's a brutally competitive industry, but... Um, <coughs> Minister, again, for you. I'm, so, and as I said earlier, you know, I worked in the industry, and I, I always remember a, a sort of another uh, strawberry grower that I knew from Somerset, uh, who told me the story that um, he uh, was taking his strawberries to the depot to be uh, delivered, and there was an appalling uh, car crash on the M5, which meant they were stuck in traffic. Uh, totally un un unavoidable. Uh, and he phoned the depot to say, look, I'm really sorry, there's been this horrendous... Uh, a car crash on the motorway, I'm going to be about 45 minutes late. And the reply was, you've got 15 minutes, um, which is a slightly bizarre thing, because he could do nothing about this um, situation. And I um, have also seen situations as a producer myself where um, the same batch of soft fruit would be accepted by uh, one supermarket depot from a name, you know, whichever supermarket, but rejected by another. And the reason it might be rejected by another is that they'd misjudged their sales, so they needed to find an excuse to reject it. So there, was, there has been lots of problems like that. I do think, though, that the grocery code has definitely improved things. Um, it's definitely meant that some of the sort of abusive practices, such as so-called margin buckets, where... Uh, producers are expected to contribute a particular amount of margin to a supermarket and if, uh, if the, the price relationship means that at the end of the season they haven't got it, they're almost um, told they've got to pay up uh, in order to, to carry on. And some of the uh, other things such as paying for you know, promotion, I think uh, we've made some good progress on that. And Christine uh, Taken has um, you know, done some investigations and has, I think that's starting to have an impact. And um, just before the... Uh, um, 
uh, last election, or well, election before last, we obviously changed the uh, rules as well so that she could also levy fines. So we've made progress. Now, we have got a call for evidence at the moment uh, on uh, whether we could extend the uh, remit of the GCA to ask for views on that. I have to say that it, it's quite an undertaking to suddenly, you, you totally transform the nature of this organisation if you're suddenly trying to police all uh, relationships. I think a lot can be done by making sure that the processors also abide by the code, because I think sometimes what happens is it's a bit too easy maybe for people selling on behalf of the processor to kind of let down their farmer members than actually stand up and hold their purchasers to the code. Uh, and it takes two to make this code work, in my view. But we are, as part of our uh, work on um, post-Brexit strategy and post-Brexit policy, we're looking at a, you know, a range of different things in terms of uh, whether we can do things, um, tweak regulations, um, uh, improve statute in some ways to, to give a, um, a greater fairness when it comes to contracting. It's a complex area because freedom of contract is also a very important uh, feature of a market economy, uh, but it is an area that we are looking at. No. I, I would very much like to see Kristen Kagan have the, the, uh, the ability to be able to, I don't think she can go in to sort of for all primary producers across to uh, processors, but if she could do some spot checks, um, and I think if you, you know, a lot of, a lot of the grocery code adjudicators' powers in a way are the fact that she's there um, and that, that she can take action, and, and I think that's what we need to try and broaden if we can, and I accept, you know, it'd be a huge undertaking to do it all, but I think if there could be some spot checks, that would be good i also think i think the retailers have improved but i think also you know if suddenly the weather changes you know you're, it's all barbecue 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 and then we have you know thunderstorms and it all changes um then of course you've got a lot of salad and other things that, are, that you know will go to waste and it's making sure those contracts are fulfilled and i know we had some kenyan bean growers uh of, of green beans come in and they'd also had their contracts um just you know just they said we don't want them beans anymore and that was it and they had to plow them all in um, and so you know it's not only here in this country it is even beyond where we do have to be fair um, to those and of course if it's a perishable product that's when you know cereals you can sort of keep them in a heap for a bit longer even meat you can store for a while but vegetables you can't and I think you know and, and George knows that you know as a, as a strawberry grower when the strawberries are fit they're fit and, and that's it. David, did you want to just well, just I quick concur comment? very quickly. Yeah. Uh, I concur yeah. totally with uh, what Neil says. I mean, I think there may be a case for actually splitting the sort of role that Christine Tachon um, actually has given, so she does more strategy, and that we just get some much stronger inspectors and really look at what traceability there is in the sector. Right, we've hit the target time, I think, haven't we? Unless we have got time for another question, so I sort of round up. I think. We actually, I feel we've actually had some pledges. I don't know <laughs> we haven't used the word. I think I'm the only one that's actually really used the word, but I think we've got some pledges. And I think that it's been really encouraging to hear um, from, um, from um, George in particular about the importance of, uh, you know, the special case of uh, actually horticulture in Britain. And we really need to see uh, horticulture um, featuring strongly in the agricultural bill. I think that's the key thing for us. And uh, because it does need special attention, it's a brutally competitive industry. We're just hearing stories. You know, it is brutally competitive. Getting farmers to work together and market together does actually get over some of those issues, but that's a whole different subject. I think we've got an inquiry uh, into horticulture to look forward to... Um, um, uh, in, in next year hopefully so that's really encouraging and I think uh, we can uh, make sure that the NFU just give to attention to us because they've got such a huge area to look after so Manette that's really good and um, David if we can get the opposition to actually push our case as well I think that's really important and I think that's really really encouraging I'd absolutely agree with you I'm not a vegetarian but I would actually often buy the, the vegetarian option if I knew that it was going to be really good and really taste good. And I think it's disappointing in most, most restaurants anyway. So that is, you know, I'd absolutely agree A with pledge. that. pledge. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> good. Okay, then. Well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much to the uh, panel. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. That's that, then, George. Ah, yeah. Yeah.